Stop it. Put the gun down. Eyes are one of the pair of organs that help people and animals see. The most important thing about a man that makes him attractive is his eyes. It is a lot more important than the lower third. Hunter eyes are considered to be the best type of eyes for men. They are attractive eyes that are vertically narrow, deeply set, hooded, have a positive canthal tilt, and have an intrapupil distance IPD, that is within the normal range. The hooded look at these eyes comes from a combination of a protruding brow ridge, fat tissue above the eyes, and solid support under the eyes, caused by strong cheekbones and square orbital sockets. Hunter eyes are an extremely sexually dimorphic trait. The most important thing about hunter eyes is that they are vertically narrow, which means that their width to height ratio is high and their vertical scleral show is low. In Caucasians, the width to height ratio of men's eyes is larger than that of women's eyes, while women's eyes are rounder or more neotenous. Asians and Africans have the same difference between the sexes. The sex of human skulls can also be identified based on whether the eye sockets are more round or more square. The round, cute eyes of women are more like prey eyes. However, the space between a woman's eyes is just a little bit smaller than that between a man's eyes. Unlike prey animals, women's eyes aren't spread out like those of prey animals. People who are generally thought to be conventionally attractive, like male models, tend to have pronounced hunter eyes. Men with hunter eyes have piercing, predatory looking eyes that make them look very dominant and dangerous. Their eyes give their owners a striking look, which suggests that they are usually seen as attractive. Deep set hunter eyes may have developed over time to help men fight, hunt, and compete with other men for mates. They may also protect men's eyes from fists, claws, sticks, and other objects, or they may serve to just scare other men. How to get hunter eyes. Let me start off by saying that how to get hunter eyes is a terrible way to approach looks maxing. My mentality maxing playlist is required viewing before you move ahead on your looks maxing quest. It will change how you think, which will lead to better results at the end of the day. Your goal should be to fix objective failures in a realistic way. I mean, do you have an average eye area? The risk slash benefit analysis of going through five procedures to get an O pri tier eye area is a bad idea for two reasons. A. You will never reach your goal. And B. The results will most likely be disappointing. Remember to take surgeries as an investment. You want to be truly effective. You shouldn't be doing surgery for halos, but rather fixing objective failures. Personally, I don't think it's possible for you to change your regular eye area into hunter eyes. It's basically impossible. And even if you go through five surgeries to make it happen, you'll still look uncanny. So in this series, we'll be looking at some common eye area failures that prevent you from having hunter eyes their possible solutions, and how to fix them and make your eyes more hunter-like. So sit back and settle in, since there's much to uncover in a brief time frame. I have been looking through the r slash am I ugly subreddit to get an idea of the most common eye area failures that prevent ugly and normie guys from having hunter eyes. So let's go over the most common failures and how to fix them. There is a possibility that you have these failures. And that's what's stopping you from getting an extra point or two on your objective face rating. Negative canthal tilt. Being bug-eyed, so this includes large eye orbits, having a recessed brow ridge, and excessive amounts of upper eyelid exposure are the most common failures I've identified after analyzing thousands of faces. You might not get hunter eyes if you fix these failures, rather just an improved eye area but that depends on how your eye area is to begin with. Hunter eyes are the most difficult to achieve because they are the result of a combination of factors, not just one or two. 
The use of eyeliner, eyeshadow, and other cosmetics can help women to create the illusion of having a different eye shape, but these techniques only go so far. There is also no one particular surgery to get hunter eyes. Ignore anyone who tells you that. Focusing on fixing objective failures should be your only goal. In this series, we'll go over all the failures. However, since it's the most common one, let's talk about upper eyelid exposure in this video. The degree to which a person's eyelids are exposed is known as their eyelid exposure. Double eyelids are a characteristic of many Europeans that some people wish they had. However, too much upper eyelid exposure can give you that creepy, bug-eyed look. A significant amount of upper eyelid is exposed in the top image. Upper eyelid exposure is hardly visible in the middle picture, and it is completely absent in the bottom picture. Less exposure makes the eye look better. When the tops of the eyes are completely covered, they are called hooded. Look at the difference in how much skin is showing around each man's eyes. The most common kind of exposure is above the eyes. However, if you have exposed lower eyelids as well, you will automatically fall into the sub-4 OFR category. It's because any trait that prevents the development of hunter eyes, such as the presence of upper eyelids, should be considered a huge failure. Hence, it is very important that UEE stays as low as possible. Hooded eyes are more stereotypically associated with men. However, hooded eyes can be attractive on women as well. How exposed or visible a person's upper eyelids are affects the overall appearance of their eyes. This is more crucial for men than women. It is very common for people to have hooded eyes, in which the upper eyelid is barely visible. Too much upper eyelid exposure can even hurt a woman's eyes. But some women's eyes look better with some upper eyelid exposure. Keep in mind that women, unlike men, alter the appearance of their upper eyelid exposure using makeup rather than resorting to invasive procedures like surgery or fillers. Again, women always win and most men lose. Taylor Kinney is the epitome of the hooded eyed person. The top orbital bone and soft tissue entirely conceal his upper eyelids, so they are completely hidden from view. Michael Emerson's lack of upper eyelid hooding is a contributing factor, though not the main cause, to his unattractive eyes and overall poor OFR, or objective face rating. Ozil is lucky he's good at football because his eyelids look like foreskins. If we compare him to this man, who has a lot of upper eyelid showing, it doesn't look dominant or intimidating at all, and it makes him look even more exhausted. Upper eyelid exposure is unattractive because it makes you look tired and makes your eyes look bigger, which gives you the impression of creepy, bug eyes. Although minimal upright exposure is acceptable, it is giga attractive. If there is no upper eyelid exposure at all, such as when the brow ridge completely overshadows the eyes, which is often referred to as hooded. This man, who I would say is below average, has a lot of upper eyelid exposure and other failures like a negative canthal tilt, that makes his eyes look very bad. Exposed upper eyelids can make a person look older and more fatigued. You can see how it can give you a tired, bug-eyed appearance on the right. Hunter eyes with hoods are on the left. As you can see, there is less upper eyelid exposure. They radiate a more attractive air of alertness and concentration. What causes UEE? Exposed upper eyelids can be caused by a receding brow ridge or a lack of subcutaneous fat in the area above the eye. As more of the brow falls over the eyes, less of the eyelid is seen. How much of the eyelids show depends a lot on how far forward the eye socket sticks out and what shape it has. Most of the time, how much of the eyelid shows depends on the shape and placement of the upper orbit as well as the amount of fat and soft tissue in that area. The latter is more important. Your eye orbits are narrower while you're young. In contrast, both the aperture's breadth and area becomes larger as we get older. The orbital bones get weaker and wear away, which makes the eye sockets bigger because they can't hold up as much. 
How much upper eyelid exposure you have depends on how your upper orbit is shaped and where it is located. The fat deposits and soft tissue composition of that spot will also play a role. If there isn't enough support under the eyes, the skin can sag, making you look tired. Hunter eyes are giga attractive, so by covering your upper eyelids, you'll be one step closer to getting them. How to use this guide. Since the beginning of October 2018, I've been researching looks maxing methods that are backed up by science. In that time, I've learned a lot about looks maxing methods, especially how they can work together to help you transform into a better version of yourself. These guides will help you figure out which methods can help you and which will hinder and be a waste of your money and time for your desired goals. I will rank all the relevant methods to decrease your upper eyelid exposure into these four tiers. Methods will include both soft and hard maxing, for both the short and long term. Again, this should be very clear and easy to understand. I won't tell you to go the hard way because soft maxing is more likely to work for you. So, always choose the soft option. Having too many surgeries will never help. Find your biggest failures and only use the hard way to fix them. The hope tier is the main method you need to use to reach this goal. It's your key to reaching your goal. Hence, it's the most ideal option. Most people who want to achieve this goal should choose key options. They will either work on their own or are needed to make another method work better. These will be the first methods you should think about for your goal. In terms of research, the key options will be the ones that have been explored the most. The dope tier will include options with a proven track record of success. They are methods that will most definitely work, but only in the right context. They cannot be recommended for everyone, but if you do your own research or consult a surgeon, depending on the method, and you find that you meet the criteria, feel free to add the method to your goal instead of the methods in the key tier. The cope tier is another group of methods that might help, but there isn't enough evidence to say for sure. They cannot be recommended, with the same confidence as proven options. They could work or be a waste of your time, money, or both. There is not enough evidence to know for sure. Think about these options, but be careful about how you add them to your looks maxing protocol. The NOPE tier will include methods that are claimed to provide benefits but have been shown to be ineffective. If a method is deemed too risky to be used, it will also be found in this tier. Try to avoid these techniques at all costs. They are usually useless, dangerous, or both. Let's start with the NOPE tier. Bone smashing. Bone smashing is a theory based on Wolf's Law, which says that bones will remodel in response to stress. Basically, this theory states that you can make bones grow by hitting them with blunt objects over and over again. It is based on a misunderstanding of Wolf's Law, which talks about the internal, trabecular organization and density of the bone, not the bone's overall shape. Don't ever, ever, ever smash your eyes or the area around them with anything. It might only cause a temporary swelling and not real bone growth, and the results might not be predictable enough to guarantee an ideal outcome. You could get blind at worst. No one can put enough constant stress on their faces to increase their bone density. Too much trauma can cause broken bones and permanent scarring and too much trauma over and over again can irritate or damage the nerves. Now we can go on to finasteride. Guys who aren't dealing with hair loss sometimes take finasteride in the hopes that it may make their upper eyelids less visible. The upper eyelid exposure of the guy who shared his hair loss progress on the More Plates More Dates subreddit has been significantly reduced. Guys, I am not sure what else he did besides taking Fin and Minox but DHT has no effect on eyelids' fat deposits. Taking fin to prevent DHT production while you are not even bald is ridiculous. The same holds true with minoxidil. Your eyelid fat pads will remain unaffected by minoxidil. If anything, it makes collagen worse. As a result, if your hairline isn't thinning, you should avoid both of them at all costs. Stimulants. There is no better pre-workout supplement than caffeine, and it also affects the upper lids. 
it should come as no surprise that your UEE will vary depending on how alert or sleepy you are, but the actual change will be so minute that you won't even realize it. Your UEE will be significantly larger if you haven't gotten enough sleep, and it will be slightly smaller if you're feeling rested and at ease while still being mentally aware. This is due to muscle laxity and compensation. With clinical ptosis, you get an eyebrow that will be high because the lid is lax. So the upper eyelid rises because it is actively fighting the downward pull of the ptosis. So when you fix ptosis, the eyelids tend to get lower afterwards. In this case, something like a temporary ptosis occurs due to sleep deprivation or lack of alertness. That doesn't imply that you should guzzle coffee all day to decrease your UEE though. You can enjoy your decreased UEE right when you start your workout, but you shouldn't try to decrease it with caffeine an hour later when you're tired and the caffeine is out of your system. Your eyelid exposure may get worse than before the drink. But don't worry, there are ways to decrease your eyelid exposure both temporarily and permanently. But first, let's go over the copes. Ice hooding. A popular method to decrease upper eyelid exposure is called ice hooding. This is where you get something really cold, preferably a piece of ice, and place it on your eyelids for 5 minutes. This stimulates brown fat production, and you'll get an immediate increase in your eye hooding by increasing the fat in the region. You'll need to use this consistently to get permanent results. Because of this, the people who live in the tundra have evolved to have low upper eyelids. Generally, it is known that cold thermogenesis, cold therapy, Wim Hof and especially Jack Cruz deliver awesome information on this, puts your body in a fat burning mode, as the cold basically melts your fat cells. That's why many surgeons nowadays offer cryotherapy, because it works. Longer exposures, like ice bathing, stimulates the production of brown adipose tissue, especially in your upper torso. Brown adipose tissue doesn't insulate and doesn't store fat like your basic white adipose tissue. It burns fat into heat. That's why Wim Hof and all the Himalayan monks can live easily in the cold, because they radiate heat. Cold thermogenesis has a lot of other benefits, but let's focus on the eyes for now. The general idea is to submerge your eye area in water that is less than 7 degrees Celsius regardless of whether you opt for a full-on ice bath, in which you submerge your head and face, or merely splash your face with icy water. The delicate skin around your eyes store more fat after being exposed to the cold, and the effects can be seen almost immediately. The area around the eyes should be the last part of the body to have a little fat, because it's important for the health and protection of the eyes. The padding of fat around the eyes serves a protective purpose, keeping out the cold, dust, and other potential threats. It's up to you to test whether or not this method is effective when only the face is exposed, or if you also need that full body ice bath. To sum it up, the fat that forms a ring around the eyeball should be present on the average human body as a natural defense mechanism against wind or snow. If you want to make it a habit, I recommend doing it once every day and using cold water or purchasing ice cubes or freezing water to use as needed. It hurts like hell at first because your face slash skin isn't used to the expansion of the veins beneath the skin. But every time you do it, it gets one, more comfortable, and two, easier to do for longer and longer periods of time. Mewing. With proper breathing techniques, can an ugly, subhuman creature become a model? Thank you for your time. I think it's going to be more than breathing techniques, and I say why. Mewing helps to realign your tongue and improve your head posture. Excessive upper eyelid exposure may be the result of poor head posture, which can lead to droopy eyes. Also, if your tongue isn't in the right place, your hard palate doesn't get much stimulation. Mewing involves repositioning the tongue and pressing against the roof of the mouth or the hard palate. When you put pressure on your hard palate, you make your mid face move up and outward. A byproduct of this is more pronounced cheekbones, but it also has positive effects on your eyes. 
Your eyes become more vertically compact when you mew. As your mid-face goes up, so does the bone structure around your eyes. This extra support makes your eyes look wider horizontally, which is a good thing from an aesthetic point of view. As your eye structure moves up, mewing can make your upper eyelids cover more, making your eyes look more hooded. Mewing can help with droopy eyes, which is another good thing for your eyes. Since there is more support under your eyes, this can create a positive canthal tilt. Given the lack of supporting research and the possibility that it won't help anyone over the age of 25, I placed mewing in the cope tier. But just like every other method in the cope tier, you have nothing to lose here. It won't cost you a dime, and in the long run, you might even benefit from it. Eye exercises. Having weak eye muscles is a common cause of UEE. There are a lot of Luxmaxes who used to have bad UEE, but after some orbiculous training, their UEE nearly completely disappeared. There are four primary muscles that support the eyes. If the area around the eyes isn't properly supported, and the tendons are weak, they may droop. This is not the case with other muscles because they have support. Eyelid pulling. One method you can use for decreasing your upper eyelid exposure is eyelid pulling. Repeatedly doing this will cause the fat above your upper eyelids to shift downwards and conceal your eyes. This TikTok user supposedly changed his death to your eye area with eyelid pulling. The palpebral eyelid fat can be easily and effectively pulled down using this method. First, we pinch the skin in the crease of our eyelids with two fingers. Secondly, gently stretch the skin until you can feel fat between your fingers. Third, drag or pull down towards the eye. Do this anywhere from 5 to 25 times, with each repetition lasting anywhere from 1 to 5 seconds. At most, do it 1 to 4 times per day. If you're lucky, you will see the effects of this method almost immediately. Apparently, this guy only had to do it for 14 days to see a change. I think a month of work would be great for you if your skin is more elastic. Orbicularis oculi hypertrophy. This method is even easier, and anecdotal evidence suggests that it makes the canthal tilt better because it strengthens the infraorbital support. The orbicularis oculi is a muscle in the face that closes the eyelids. It comes from the nose part of the frontal bone, the frontal process of the maxilla in front of the lacrimal groove, and the front surface and edges of the medial palpebral ligament which is a short band of fibers. From this point, the fibers grow outward to form a wide, thin layer that covers the eyelids, or palpebrae, goes around the orbit, spreads over the temple, and goes down the cheek. When you squint, you're using the orbicularis oculi muscles, which are located around each eye. Well-developed orbicularis oculi muscles would contribute to the appearance of hooded eyes. As you can see in the post-operative pic, her eyeballs protrude more and she has more scleral show. To work the outer part of the opicularis oculi, do exactly what she's doing. To avoid getting nasolabial folds, make sure to stretch your mouth down when you do the movement. You can also add more resistance by gently pulling down on the outside corner of your eyes. To work the inner part, scrunch the entire middle part of your face like in this picture. And like before, when doing the movement, keep your mouth stretched downwards. Step 1 involves tensing the eye muscles to make it look like you're about to close your eyes very tightly. Step 2, hold for between 1 and 10 seconds, depending on how hard we want to work it. Step 3, the muscle contraction is released. In the fourth and final step, we continue to do this until we feel a little bit of strain. You can repeat this exercise several times a day by doing 10 legitimate reps. Squinting. By squinting, you can strengthen the muscles that hold up and protect your eyes. This exercise, in contrast to the previous one, places greater emphasis on the eyebrows. The consequence is a narrowing of the space between the eyes and the brow, which gets rid of the upper eyelid exposure. With the increased blood flow brought on by this exercise, the supraorbital region will be more fertile for growth and better able to withstand the mechanical stress of expansion. 
First, starting with your face's natural position, tighten these muscles. Second, maintain that position for at least a few seconds. The third step is to keep doing it till you're comfortable. That is what your face will look like once you make this expression. Some of these exercises can cause wrinkles known as crow's feet, which are quite prevalent in hooded or hunter eyes. Although Michelle Marone's eyes are clearly appealing, his crow's feet can be a nuisance to some. Because of this, I'll soon be putting out a skincare guide that will help you avoid these problems. Sleep. There is no supporting evidence that sleep reduces UEE. Some people say that sleeping will change how much of your upper eyelid shows, while others say it won't. I've noticed that most dudes get four or five hours of sleep before they begin their looks maxing journey. After adjusting to 10 hours of sleep per night, however, they saw improvements in UEE. If you usually sleep eight to nine hours, I guess adding an hour won't make much of a difference. However, quality sleep is crucial to your health in so many ways. Absolutely nothing will work if you aren't getting enough deep sleep every night. If you're having trouble sleeping, I recommend watching my video on sleep. And the same holds true for water. Getting adequate water will not only improve your health, but it can also impact your UEE. For the vast majority of you guys, your hooding will be better in the morning when you wake up, and worse in the afternoon and evenings. There are days when there is a lot more than a little. Are you wondering why this occurs? You haven't had anything to drink in hours, so your body instinctively wants to save what little water it has. For this reason, some guys use cool pads first thing in the morning to reduce puffiness. Think of Patrick Bateman in American Psycho. Subliminals. Out of all the copes in this list, this one is the least likely to work. My confidence in humanity has been severely shaken by the existence of people who believe in subliminals. Seriously, it's brutally over for you if you waste your time doing subliminals. Now let's move on to dope tier. Now, Surgical options will be part of this tier because, let's be honest, they're the most effective. However, you'll need to spend some serious cash and take some time off to heal. You may want to talk to a surgeon. Your specific requirements will dictate the procedures that is best suited to you. Ptosis correction. If you have upper eyelid ptosis, or droopy upper eyelids, it causes your eyebrows to elevate in order to help lift the droopy upper eyelids. Once the upper eyelids are lifted through eyelid ptosis surgery, your eyebrows will relax down and give you a more hooded look. Eyelid ptosis is done by an oculoplastic specialist, and it can be done under local anesthesia. If you think you might benefit from ptosis correction surgery, consult a surgeon. People whose upper eyelids droop over their pupil or partially cover them may need ptosis correction surgery to get clear vision back. Some people may not be good candidates for ptosis repair surgery even though it can greatly improve the way the affected eye looks and works. Upper blepharoplasty. A surgeon may suggest you have blepharoplasty, which is a procedure that can repair droopy eyelids. Excessive amounts of fat, muscle, and skin are commonly removed during this treatment. To achieve the hunter eye shape, almond eye surgeries, including a blepharoplasty, eyelid implants, and possible ptosis repair. Supraorbital implants. Another way to fix UEE would be to get a superorbital, below the brow ridge, implant. It will last forever unless it triggers an infection. Given that it is a one-of-a-kind 3D printed implant, the cost of the procedure to receive the implant alone cannot be less than $10,000. This implant combines an infraorbital rim implant which provides better under eye support, a lateral rim implant and a supraorbital rim implant to fix the UEE. Botox. I used to think Botox for the eye area was cope, but take a look at these results. You can see there is no squinting going on at all. It's easily the best and most natural eye area change I've seen. This guy got these results just by lowering his brow with Botox. Keep in mind that these are not fillers, but rather merely Botox but the results are on par with a good proportion of surgical treatments. Botox is tricky because almost no plastic surgeons talk about doing this technique. Everything is about lifting, which makes the problem worse. Most of the doctors who do Botox will say, I've never been asked to do this. 
As a result, if I were considering Botox, I'd go to a plastic surgeon who specializes in Botox. And possibly even an eye surgeon who specializes in Botox, because they'll be the most knowledgeable about the muscles around the eye. This guy showed his doctor a morph of himself with the brow drooped, and he described the hooded eye's effect that he wanted. She apparently understood immediately what he meant, and she injected 14 units, at $9 per unit, into his frontalis and procerus muscles. Most of it went into the frontalis. Overall, Botox is an excellent method for concealing your upper eyelids. Perhaps you'll get Botox in the middle of your brow. The Botox will relax the muscles in your eyebrow, causing it to droop and conceal your upper eyelid. Even though it could be a great way to get hooded eyes, you should be careful not to go too far with it. If your eyebrows are too low, you may look angry, not in a good way, and uncanny. Botox is also pretty safe. About 1 in 300 people will experience temporary complications, most of which will resolve on their own. 1 in a million people will get botulism, and it'll really mess you up. The only downside to Botox is that you'd have to get it done every 6 to 9 months. Fat grafting Another surgical option for reducing UEE is fat grafting. If you want a more permanent way to reduce your upper eyelid exposure, fat grafting may be a better choice. Fat grafting can create a double-fold eyelid crease and treat upper eyelids that are sunken and have more than one fold. For the procedure, they will first take fat from other parts of your body. They will take a tiny amount from your belly, hips, thighs, and so on. They will then use the fat they took out to make pure fat. Next, the doctor will use cannulas to inject small amounts of fat into the areas where it is needed. Fat grafting is not something I would recommend for thin eyelid skin. However, it can be done in the area of the lower brow, where the skin is thicker. Wherever the fat was injected, new vessels will grow. Because of this, the fat will grow and keep your upper eyelid in its new shape. You might not get the same results though. About 50 to 70% of the fat injected will stay after a fat grafting procedure. You'll probably have to go through a follow-up procedure to improve your results. You should expect to undergo at least two procedures if you decide to go through with a fat grafting procedure. It's not uncommon for post-operative swelling to persist for up to a year. Also, the size of the grafted area could be affected by different things. For example, if you gain or lose weight quickly, it can make it bigger or smaller. Your surgeon will have to figure it out if you have lost volume because of a lack of fat or because your orbital bone has pushed out. Sometimes it can be either or both. A face-to-face -face consultation will help the surgeon figure out the best way to do your procedure. Testosterone maxing. In addition to surgical interventions, testosterone maxing is a natural method for reducing UEE. A higher testosterone level will increase bone density, which means a stronger brow ridge, stronger eye support, and more defined cheekbones. One drawback is that you need to be in puberty for this to work. In other words, keep your testosterone levels up during adolescence. If you are past puberty, you can try to gain weight. You can get to the higher end of the normal range of body fat. Unfortunately, not everyone will see results from this technique because of how their fat is distributed and how the structure of their face is. Gaining weight would also mean giving up hollow cheeks, potentially attractive abs, and an overall more attractive low body fat percentage. However, it may be worthwhile as your eye area has the greatest impact on your SMV. Eyebrow maxing. If your eyebrows are low set and positively or neutrally tilted, it can give the impression that your brow ridge is low. To avoid looking too feminine, low slung brow ridge compensates with a touch of UEE. Summerholder is a great example of that. Despite the fact that he has negative canthal tilt and less than ideal hooding, his thick and positively tilted eyebrows save him. Eyelash maxing. In my eyelash maxing video, I try to explain how having longer eyelashes can give an illusion of reduced upper eyelid exposure. Eyelashes that are long and curled give an illusion of hidden UEE and divert attention elsewhere. You'll look like you have more hooded eyes. Remember that merely growing longer and curling your eyelashes won't add fat pads in the area or conceal your UEE. We are talking about nothing more than an illusion. Don't forget to check out the video on eyelash maxing where I explain everything in greater depth. Before we leave the realm of illusion, let's discuss angle frauding. To be honest, this seems like a no-brainer to me. If you take a selfie from the below angle, you will have lots of UEE in your pictures. 
but if you shoot from eye level, you'll get minimal UEE, roughly the same as what you'd see in a mirror, and your photos won't turn out too badly. That being said, I hope it goes without saying that you should never take photos from below. All your pictures should be taken at eye level or above. Next, let's check out some effective softmaxes. Everyone has a little ptosis, so it's possible you don't even know you have it. Yes, even Opry has them. Eyelid glue is an effective treatment for ptosis. A temporary solution to making the face look more symmetrical is to use glue or tape on the eyelids. Because it's a softmax and you'll have to do it every day, I wouldn't bother with it if you have even minor symmetries, unless you're going on a date or just mugging. It's also a great tool for making Asians appear Caucasian. It's a harmless softmax which can also be used to acquire additional hooding. Makeup is another softmax that I recommend. There is makeup you can do to conceal your upper eyelid and give the illusion of a better hooding. I will bring a very detailed guide to makeup, which will include not only this, but also how to fake better skin and bones with very little makeup, so stay tuned for that. Tinted or photochromic glasses. Keep in mind that I'm talking about tinted glasses here. Tinted glasses to hide your terrible eye area. Glasses are generally a bad looksman choice. When you're nearsighted, your glasses act like shrunken glasses, and if you need a strong prescription, more than minus five dioptries, they can ruin your harmony by making your eyes look smaller than they actually are. In addition, they reduce the size of everything in your mind, is which is distortio. Take a look at the curves of this guy's cheek. It should be obvious from a quick glance in the mirror that the minus 15 dioptry power of these glasses is completely ridiculous. When worn by someone who is farsighted, the glasses act like a magnifying glass, expanding the wearer's apparent eye size and making distant objects appear closer than they actually are. Take another look at her cheekbones and notice how the plus three dioptries are already distorting her visibility. Contact lenses are much better for correcting vision than glasses because they can put right into the eye. They do not make the eyes look bigger or smaller, and they eliminate all distortion of vision. One disadvantage of contact lenses is that even colorless lenses cause your eyes to reflect light and look like marbles when exposed to sunlight. If you've never tried contact lenses before, I promise you, it will be like looking at the world for the first time through clear glass. One's need for corrective lenses indicates visual impairment, much like a beta genetic flaw. Wearing glasses does not imply a high IQ or superior intelligence either. Wearing glasses is a major looksman because it broadcasts to the world your inherently inferior vision. In the past, poor eyesight meant that people were unable to spot potential prey far off in the distance. Women have evolved to feel repulsed by men who wear eyeglasses. The best option by far is to use contact lenses. But if you want to decrease upper eyelids, tinted glasses or glasses with lenses that change color in response to light are probably your best choices. Why? There are three main reasons. One benefit is that they can help you make your face look more balanced. Second, they can hide a below average eye area. Third, you can legitimately fashion max by wearing trendy frames with tinted lenses. This may be your best choice if your upper eyelid is very open or if the area around your eyes looks bad and you can't fix it with other soft maxing techniques. The best option might be to just hide your eye area. Literally hide your eye area behind a tint. Why are you wearing glasses? Sunglasses. Yeah, we're inside. We are inside. Very perspicacious of you. I have bad eyes. You have bad eyes. I have bad eyes because... Eyewear with a more square off shape, such as aviators or wayfarers, can help define your features. You probably have a narrow, underdeveloped jaw and recessed cheekbones if you're here watching this video. Therefore, square or rectangular boxier frames are the best bet. At all costs, avoid frames with any kind of curve or roundness. It's possible to fake more facial structure, especially around the eyes, by wearing glasses with a strong brow line, which gives an illusion of a prominent brow ridge. So let's take a look at some examples, shall we? Kevin Samuels, who passed away recently, rose to fame on YouTube by mocking middle-aged women for their unrealistic standards. He was an utterly based guy. This is an old mugshot of him. The eye region is obviously subpar. Take a look at Kevin now that he's been fashion maxed with some lenses that have a slight grey tint. 
To be clear, I'm not saying that David Gandhi, who has god-level hunter eyes, will be able to ascend while wearing tinted glasses. But if your eyes are your weak point, however, a pair of glasses with a subtle tint, gradient tint, or full-on photochromatic lenses in a fashion max and an epic looks max. A better example is Tate, who never takes off his glasses when he's talking. This guy, who is another well-known YouTube traveller, does this. Hope tier. At this point, many of you are probably thinking that surgical, that surgical intervention is your only hope for fixing your UEE. Though surgical options exist, a variety of hyaluronic acid fillers have made it possible to treat this area without surgery. I won't go into too much detail because I'm going to put out a full guide on dermal fillers soon, not only for UEE, but for the whole face. Dermal fillers vary in their chemical makeup, how long they last, and how soft they are. Lip fillers tend to be softer, while cheekbone fillers may need to be sturdier. In the past, fillers were either temporary fixes or permanent surgeries, but now there are also temporary and semi-permanent options. Stay away from any kind of permanent filler in the eye area. Fillers injected around the eyes, especially in the upper eyelids, is a very complicated procedure that not many people do. Fillers are the most effective option overall for your severe upper eyelid exposure. This basically fills in all of the exposed areas and solves the problem. If your eyes are extremely deep set and you have a bug-like appearance, it could help reduce the prominence of both. Dermal fillers can help if the crease around your eyes is too high. It can help if you get hunter eyes by making the crease lower. Fillers can work like magic to restore fullness to a hollowed out eye area. In my opinion, fillers are the best option for decreasing upper eyelid exposure because of their convenience and predictability. You can ask a doctor if you can get fillers for your upper eyelids. Your doctor will work with you to find the best type and amount of filler for your problem areas. He'll opt for a method that's easier and more predictable for you. The hyaluronic acid fillers, Restylane and Juvederm, could be used for your procedure. Having an excellent doctor carry this out is crucial. Remember that the goal of eyelid fillers is to add volume, but, but it's, it's important not to inject too much filler. The filler must be injected into a deep enough layer to be effective. It's important to use the right filler for the right spot. You'll get the best outcome if you do all of those things. At the end of the day, the result needs to look natural. Even if you are slightly overfilled, you can end up looking fake or uncanny. Overfilling can also cause the Tyndall effect. So prevention should be your doctor's top priority. I know you had a, you had a pretty bad accident uh, like a few months ago, right? I actually did, yeah. I actually broke my jaw. I'm observing your jaw to see you had it wired shut and all that? I did. I was like running through my house and I slipped and fell and hit my face. If you were trying to get plastic surgery, you wouldn't get that. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you got a good jaw, man. No, I'm oh my God. <laughs> um, you're just stirring the pot. <laughs> no, it was funny. It sucked. I almost died, but we're good. But you're good now. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. To avoid this, it's important to use the right filler and the right amount of filler, as well as the right filling technique. This is where knowing about eye surgery and having done it before is very helpful. Every part of the area below the brow has its own anatomy, which is important for placing filler correctly. For example, there is a space between the center of the brow and just behind the skin of the brow where filler can be put in a way that makes the material stable and has a big effect on hollowing eyebrow position and eyebrow shape. When it comes to the upper eyelid, using the right technique is even more important. There are many important structures. You want it to go as deep as possible, right under the eyebrow on the upper eyelid, above the eyelid crease. Your doctor's goal should be to keep the eyes in more of a youthful, natural shape. I suggest finding a doctor who uses an instrument like a blunt-tipped cannula instead of needles. When using needles, the shaft of the needle penetrates through the skin and down to the depth where the filler is injected. A cannula, on the other hand, has a smooth, rounded tip that prevents it from puncturing the skin. The cannula, which is inserted through the skin, requires a small incision to be made with a needle though. There shouldn't be any bruising, but you may experience some mild swelling. Even though the body can safely break down fillers, this does not negate the need for regular maintenance. Healing and recovery time are usually short and people often go back to work right away. While the use of cannulas greatly reduces the likelihood of noticeable bruising and swelling, it is still possible to experience some mild bruising. 
which should go away within a week. You should make an appointment with your doctor a week or two after the procedure to see how the filler has settled, and, if necessary, to make more improvements. Keep in mind that this is not a surgical procedure, so there is no recovery time. The only thing that would prevent you from going out so soon after getting fillers is if you still had some minor bruising from the injections, but that should be easily concealed with makeup. This is different from fat grafting, where you would likely have to wait at least a couple of weeks because of swelling and bruising. In most cases, the results of filler treatment are stable after the two-week checkup. You can go back to your daily life almost right away, but you will have to go back for follow-up care and maintenance visits on a regular basis. But keep in mind that fillers aren't permanent. On average, most dermal fillers will last between 6 and 12 months. But some people say that their fillers can last for 2 years. Most of the time, we hear that fillers last for 6 months in a place where they're injected, where they rest in the tissue between the cells. After that, they move to another part of your face until they are finally absorbed by your body 3 to 4 years later. However, how long the effects of the filler injection last depend on where it was injected. For the upper part of the nose, for instance, fillers can last for up to a year. Here is an Instagram post from a doctor who used fillers to correct upper eyelid exposure, and the result lasted an incredible three years. Until I saw this on Tanban's website, I had to assume the doctor was LARPing to drum up business. The fillers around the eyes last much longer than the rest of the face. So, if your doctor were to inject Restylane into your upper eyelids, you could expect it to last for up to 12 to 18 months, maybe even more, while using the same filler in your cheeks or lips would only give you a 6 month boost. There's a good chance that your upper eyelid fillers will last on average 2 years. One more really important point is that if it's the second time the filler is injected around the eyes, it has a tendency to last much longer than the first time. So the first time is expected to last about a year and a half, and maybe even two years, but the second time will last much longer than the first time. So it's not something you have to keep repeating every six months, or of the year, or even if every few years. When you factor in the cost of a filler injection, around $400 or £400, covering your upper eyelids will only cost you $200 per year. If your UEE is what's holding you back, then that's your fair cost to ascension. But if your eyes are not deep set, you will always have upper eyelid exposure, and no surgery or filler can change that. Nothing you do will make a big difference, and that's why I'll be covering eye deep setness in more detail in the next video. Nonetheless, that wraps up the video for now guys. If you found this video helpful, please make sure you like it and leave your suggestions in the comments below, as it helps the YouTube algorithm.